There are several concerns that keep most people from buying EVs. I've experienced some of these firsthand, and I can't personally say that I'm ready to buy one just yet, but that may change here very soon. So today I'll explain why that is, why you may want to hold out a little longer, and the strides that automakers have made here recently. Jumping in, the biggest news this year is a new charging standard, which would be the Tesla port. And why this is so significant is that for a while, Tesla was blocking other manufacturers from using their stations. Now Tesla is opening up their technology for any other brand to use, and many have jumped on that train. We have just in the last six months or so, Hyundai, Honda, Toyota, Subaru, Rivian, Mercedes, BMW, even startups like Aptera, and many others jumping in and for good reason. This instantly adds 12,000 stations that cars like the Ionic 6 will be able to use. And these stations tend to be more reliable and better placed than a lot of these CCS chargers. Now, brands will be making adapters for their cars to work on Tesla chargers, but many of them will properly change their ports by the end of 2024, like Hyundai has promised. Here's the fine print. 12,000 Tesla stations will now be open, but many older superchargers will not support CCS vehicles. Automakers should let you know which stations will work. And until the next gen supercharger comes out, some cars with 800 volt batteries may charge a little slower than they would at 800 volt CCS stations. I also find this to be big news because it means there will be competition for CCS stations. So hopefully they'll improve them to better compete with Tesla. And then the next thing that happened the last year or so is actual price drops. Sometimes this is just through a new standard range model, like with the VW ID4, that technically lowered the starting price, but you're getting less battery. And with others like Tesla or Hyundai, it was an actual price cut across the board. Hyundai said they did this because of lower production costs, which could be true, but it also may be in order to compete without the federal tax credit. So that's been big news over the last year because here in the United States, there's a $7,500 credit that a lot of cars actually lost because of where they were manufactured. And we're also seeing sales slumps, especially on high-end EVs, which means there's more incentives and price drops from the dealer too. And now let's get past the generalizations and talk about the best and worst parts of EVs for 2024. First, electric cars deserve more attention due to increased increasing ranges and quicker charge times. Numbers have increased steadily from the 60 and 70 mile ranges of the first mass produced EVs in North America. Now a lot of cars actually do have EPA rated 300 miles of range. Remember, these are mostly ideal condition ranges, so not going down the highway at 75 miles per hour, unless they're like the Taycan or the Audi e-tron GT that have two gears, that way they're not spinning at super high revolutions on the highway. But those cars are are absurdly expensive. Something like this Ionic 6 though, costs under $50,000 and can get up to 361 miles of range. Not everybody needs to go that far. So I think it's arguably more important that you can go from 20 to 80% in just 18 minutes if you precondition the battery and the charger's filling up to it. And there are many options that are capable of freeway travel. I think the Ionic 6 is about the best value, but every Tesla offers a model that gets over 300 miles of range. The Model S actually can get up to 405. If you're really loaded, the Lucid Air can get over 500, but cars like the Ford Mustang Mach-E, the Kia EV6, all are right there at that 300 mark. And even options like the Chevy Bolt can get over 250 miles. Though it's important to note that that car actually can't fast charge. The Chevy is making an updated EV platform that will underpin the next generation of Bolt. And why that's so exciting is that that was actually an affordable car. You could get them for under under $30,000 without a tax credit. A lot of fast charging rates now are about 150 kilowatt with others like the Ionic 6 posting real world numbers for a few minutes at 235 kilowatts, which is blazing. And some tout even faster speeds. Now the caveat to fast charging is that if I'm constantly relying on a fast charger, this Ionic 6 would be more expensive to run than most internal combustion sedans, which is why you charge up at night. That's when an EV makes the most sense. And that leads us into the next reason as to why I would buy an EV. That is that they are cheaper to run and now more sustainable than ever too. 
While I would expect this to improve by now, in 2020, Consumer Reports stated that EV owners spend 60% less powering their vehicles than internal combustion folks, and they spend half as much on maintenance. Now, recently they did come out with a reliability survey that actually pegged EVs below internal combustion, but it's important to also consider which brands are making EVs right now. If you want the most reliable one, go with the brand with a better reputation or one that's been doing it for longer. The Department of Energy and Iowa National Laboratory affirms those findings and says that EV buyers save over the course of 15 years about $14,500. Of course, at that point, a new powertrain battery could be required in the near future, something that may financially total a lot of vehicles at that point. But when that battery is at the end of its life cycle, we're also seeing improvements in recycling. There's been a big push to improve this as sourcing the materials for these batteries is not the cleanest process. And beyond that improvement in sustainability, when it comes to total emissions, EVs as a whole are going to be more green than your internal combustion cars. Even if the electricity is coming from fossil fuels and we account for the emissions on production, this information comes from the Marvelous Engineering Explained. I'll link his video below that goes through the details on that if you want to know more. Now, something that EVs as of late have been doing a great job at is having a money factor that makes sense. Now there are exceptions to this because some brands just flat out get lazy or they rush a product, but cars like the Ionic vehicles from Hyundai provide more performance than a lot of their internal combustion counterparts while also giving you great ride quality, standout interior design, and immense efficiency. Because yes, it matters a lot whether or not an EV is efficient because not only will that save you on your electric bill, it also means that they don't need as big of a battery, which reduces weight and cost. And a lot of EVs, because they have a low center of gravity from their big battery packs, handle pretty well too. And they don't need to be as painstakingly boring to drive as many models are. Once again, the Ionic 6 sets a good example. Get past the silence and you have a family sedan with engaging steering and good body control. Teslas can boast similar value propositions and a federal tax credit. They also make great use of their space and are extremely versatile. Even the new Volvo XC40 Recharge and EX30 provide solid substance and capability for what you pay for. Resale value tends to be worse with EVs, but that too has improved and it largely depends on the manufacturer. Though because of the battery, I think that after 10 years, the resale will definitely be worse. And that's going to work us into the downsides. So the first thing for me, even though they are making advancements, battery life, best case scenario, you're getting probably 20 years out of these things from the research I've done. And the bigger the battery, the more expensive it is to replace. Mileage will be less of a factor than age and charging cycles. If you just drive a lot, 300,000 miles is easily possible. And electric motors should be more reliable. There's less service points. The next downside is more of a reality, and that is that you need a home charger in order for this to make sense. And depending on where you live, a lot of apartment complexes just won't have them, which really limits EVs to homeowners, something that is also really expensive to get into these days. So I would hope that city infrastructure responds to this issue and maybe builds more chargers in places that people work. That way, if your car is sitting somewhere eight hours, at least it's charging. I'd rather have cities invest in things like that than continue to incentivize owners because ultimately people will buy into these things when they're easier to own. And while many of these models do offer quite a bit for the money, the price can still be intimidating. We need more budget options like that Chevy Bolt. I get that it's more profitable to make a more expensive vehicle. That's why a lot of startups like Rivian or Tesla came out with expensive vehicles first. But if you're Toyota, why are you giving us the BZ4X when I can just see so many more people appreciating an electrified car with the same ideals as the Corolla? Something that just comes in under 30 grand, can charge fast, has a reasonable range, no frills. And I also find it frustrating that so many of these EVs have to be the most techie vehicles. Like most EVs do not come with physical HVAC controls. They're either capacitive or all embedded in the touch Screen. Many of them just have a touch screen, even for the speedometer. It's all just in the center. Tesla will even put the shifter in the screen. Now I get that a lot of 
first adopters wanted interesting features or complete minimalist design, something to really stand out. But if you're trying to appeal to more of the people who are just buying regular old trucks and cars, I think it would be beneficial to make more sensible, rational cars. They also don't really make a whole lot of sense as towing vehicles. We're seeing more trucks come out, but whenever you begin to pull a trailer, the aerodynamics and the weight of it drag down the range. So you need a stupid big battery. A 100 kilowatt hour battery is large. The new Cybertruck comes with about a 120 kilowatt hour pack, which gives it a good range. But if it's like the F-150 Lightning, that size battery is not friendly for towing. So GM offers a 200 kilowatt hour pack in the Silverado and a 246 kilowatt hour pack in the Hummer SUV. Not all of that is usable, but it's going to make that weigh 9,000 pounds or roughly a Chevy Suburban and my GR Corolla combined. And not only does that cost a lot, it's also counterproductive to the whole eco-friendly point of switching to an electric car. And honestly, the biggest reason that keeps me from being too enthusiastic about EVs is that it still seems like a band-aid solution. You can drive an electric car and reduce your footprint. I've said this before and I know this isn't a popular opinion among car loving folks, but if we want to make the biggest environmental impact and still retain our internal combustion engine, I think it would make a lot more sense to invest into city planning or public transportation, things like high speed trains or just subway systems, while also still introducing electric cars would be the better solution overall. It's a tricky topic because many manufacturers often need to be pushed in order to innovate. EVs are cleaner, and it's great to see battery recycling advance, but until we are sourcing more power from renewables and we can make batteries more sustainable with less rare earth metals, I don't think we should view electric cars as an automotive savior. Living closer to where we work and relying less on our cars, if possible, is key to reducing our emissions and transportation costs. If we squeeze or force manufacturers to ditch internal combustion, by certain dates and we don't place pressure on the other big issues, then we're not much better off and we have less charismatic cars. For now, I'm just happy we have options, whether it's EV, hybrid, or pure fossil juice. But that's my take. Let me know what you guys think in the comments section and let me know if there's any big points for or against EVs that I missed. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please leave a like and help me take on the ever elusive YouTube algorithm. Subscribe and hit the notification bell for more fun, detailed car content without fluff. Check out my Patreon for an additional podcast and I'll catch you in the next one.